Uh, hi, I am Anna, I don't know, okay. Hi, uh, I'm Anna, I uh, work for Stripe in San Francisco. Uh, this is my first Italian talk, really exciting. Yay. Um, so uh, today we're gonna talk about how to the code Base64 uh, with same machines. Or how I didn't know that stuff from college was actually gonna be useful. So, what is Base64? Base64 is a binary to text encoding schemes that represents um, binary data into a ASCII um, string format. It uses alphanumeric characters, so upper, uh, uppercase letters, lowercase letters, numbers, and two extra symbols. Those two extra symbols can be whatever you want. We have different standards. The Two more, most common are the URL safe standard, that is a dash or underscore, or a plus and slash standard, that is the standard standard, uh, the standard variant. Um, so, given that we can translate a byte uh, into base64 by taking the first six bits and uh, translating that into a letter from the alphabet, and, uh, and then the, the two bits that we left out will be a part of the next character. So every string, uh, every, uh, string has a length uh, that's dividable by four. If it's not, we can add padding. So, for example, foobar decodes into this random string. And so far, it's pretty easy and straightforward. We also have a standard library <laughs> uh, function to decode that string. It's pretty easy, right? Um, so what's this talk about? Why are we here? So I was trying to write a plugin for a security tool that uh, we were writing. And that plugin uh, was accepting Base64 from strangers. Uh, so we were writing uh, WOPT, that's a proxy that accepts, um, takes requests and uh, forward them from different applications. And we didn't know where the, the Base64 was coming from. So uh, you can encode Base64 with different standards. You can uh, um, concatenate two different Base64s joined by a strange character and stuff like that. So that standard call was not working for us. For example, how would you decode something like this with a special uh, invalid character in between? My first approach was to uh, go through the string with two indexes, analyze the first character, second one, fourth one, uh, third one, fourth one, and so on and so forth until we reach the invalid character, accept the first uh, part of the string, try to decode that, and then keep going until the end of the string, decoding the second half, and emit the result. But what's base64 anyway? Why uh, this approach was not working for us? As I mentioned before, we have different standards. Um, so the first approach was, a, was just a for loop with four or five different functions to just loop through the string, uh, accept uh, the chunk, decode the chunk, and then print the invalid character and move on. Um, keep going the string and trying to decode the second chunk and stuff like that. But that was working only with uh, one single variant nothing more. So it was not exactly uh, as maintainable and um, expandable as, as we wanted. For example, how would you encode this string? Seems pretty much the same as before, right? Uh, nothing changed too much, just two dots. But if you encode this string, you can encode this with a slash or with an, underst an underscore. Both of these variants are valid base64. 
just depends on who, who is reading it or trying to decode it. Um, so we, uh, we weren't able to decode these things with the first solution, uh, the, the one I just showed you. Because uh, once we accepted one uh, variant, we couldn't accept the other one. And uh, the variant was hard coded in the code. So for doing this, we uh, would uh, loop through the string, look for a special character, accept the, the, the special character, go back, start again. Uh, if we would meet another character, um, change, the stand, uh, change the variant, and then go back again, and start again. And it was a lot of copy pasting code all around the place. It was getting really messy. And then guess what happened when I tried to run the tests? I, yeah, it was not easy to debug. So how would you solve this problem? How would you simplify the code and avoid copy pasting a lot of uh, large functions just for two characters? Well, finite state machines. Um, I remember something about finite state machines in a class in college. It lasted an entire semester and had no idea how to actually write some code that would translate a finite state machine into a project. So this is the standard definition that I, I was given in college. Um, it doesn't make a lot, of, a lot of sense. It doesn't actually help you to write code. It basically says that an, uh, a finite state machine is an ab abstract machine that can be in exactly one of a finite, state, uh, finite number of states at a time. Um, so let's start from something you all no, um, a turnstile. It's a pretty basic example of a state, finite state machine. The turnstiles uh, can be in two states. They can, they can either be locked, so you cannot pass, or unlocked, so you can actually, you're actually allowed to go on and pass the turnstile. This is a graph uh, for a turnstile. You, uh, when you arrive, the turnstile is locked. If you try to push it, it's still locked until you insert a coin. When you insert a coin, the turnstile is unlocked. And uh, you can either insert another coin, and it will still be unlocked, or push it. And then it will get back to the locked state. In this final state machine, it doesn't matter how much you pay the, the turnstile, it will still uh, be unlocked only for one push. Um, pretty straightforward, right? Not too complicated. So how do we translate this into uh, the code in Base64? Uh, first of all, a couple of definitions, just to be on the same page. We define an alphabet, a set of symbols. In our case, uh, upper and lower case letters, numbers, and two extra symbols to reach 64 characters. Uh, strings, sequence of symbols from an alphabet, and language, a set of strings from the same alphabet. So, okay, we have three definitions, an idea of what a finite state machine is. Um, let's start draw drawing what our finite state machine would look like. We have four main states uh, the star state, where we start the final state machine and uh, end up being every time we find an invalid character. The base 64 state, that's basically the uh, alphanumeric uh, state, and two variants, the URL uh, variant or the standard variant. You can add uh, as many states as you want for different, different variants. Just let's take this for as an example to keep things easy. So for this example, for the string in the corner, um, we start at the star state, we analyzing the first character. And then we see that character is alphanumeric, so we move to the base 64 state. If it was not um, an alphanumeric character, but it was like a symbol, a uh, not valid symbol, we would keep cycling through uh, the, star, the star state until we would find a uh, a valid character. Then we uh, keep going and we uh, find a slash. This way uh, we 
point towards uh, a standard state in this case. And uh, now we are in the standard state. Keep going. More alphanumeric letters or padding characters. That's fine, we still are in the standard state and we keep analyzing the string. And then um, we find an invalid character. So with an invalid character, we move back to the standard state because we do not have an alphanumeric state, uh, character before. In the standard state, we, we, uh, we want to decode the chunk that we already parsed and uh, and then keep cycling through the string for other alphanumeric characters or um, special characters as slash underscore, um, slash dash underscore and plus, and uh, so on and so forth. In these slides, I did include the end state, uh, which is the fifth state for this state machine because it was pretty boring. Uh, it's a final, uh, final state every uh, you can reach the final state from every state in this final, in, uh, in this final state machine. And it basically just says the string is finished, right? So this is a lot of errors. I went really quickly through these diagrams. But basically, this is it. Like, this is our final state machine. Easy to follow, easy to draw. To draw. Um, almost easy to understand if you go through it like slowly and look at every single arrow. But yeah, a lot of things. Take it in. Here's a cat. Breathe, relax. Um, we are going to go through this uh, writing code. Okay, So we have states and transitions. Every circle is a state. Every transition is an arrow. We define a state as a function that reads a symbol of the input and returns the next state. Nothing more. Like the whole project was based on this line. Seems obvious, but it wasn't for me. Um, every, from every state that is like a circle, you have arrows that point to other states, and that's where you understand where to go and what state to return. Yeah, so every time you need an input, uh, a symbol of input, you need uh, a state and uh, a function that returns the next state. We have the, the four states, the URL state, standard state for the two variants, the alphabet state for uh, the alphanumeric <coughs> part, and the star state because you need a place to start. We define that, uh, those in the code. And uh, an example of uh, an implementation of a state is this one. It's just a switch case. Nothing more, no for loops, no logic, no changes, just a switch case. Based on what the input is, you, just, you return the next state. Nothing more. So, Going back to the graph, we have the URL state. We uh, have two arrows that get into the state and two arrows that get out of the state. Actually, three arrows that get into the state and two that get, gets out. Nothing more. Um, actually, yeah, uh, the end state that I didn't put in these slides because it was boring. So the switch case. Uh, if we analyze the we, we analyze the next byte or the next character of input, and if that is either alphanumeric uh, or part of the URL variant or the padding, we return the same state, and that's the the circle arrow there. Otherwise, if it's the end of the string, we return nil. Uh, we decode the chunk and return nil. Or for the default, so every other character that is not in the alphabet that we defined, we uh, emit, so we decode that chunk and go to the star state again. So that's that arrow here. Okay, so 
just a bunch of switch cases for every single circle that you had in the in the draw. You just like just like that in switch cases to follow the the arrow with a finger, saying, "Hey, yes, I need to go here. Let's go, let, let's return that state. Nothing more. It's not that complicated." That's it. So I discovered what a circle translates into the code, but what about transitions? What, what, what are those? Well, they are just the return statement in every uh, switch case. So as I said, you follow the, the arrow with the finger and return that state. That is called the transition. On top of all of these switch cases and states, we need some functions to actually do the hard work. We have the main one, it's called, we, we called it emit, and it basically decodes uh, the chunk that you, uh, that you just part, parsed. If it's an invalid chunk, you just emit a series of invalid characters um, in the output, and uh, you call that for every arrow that enters the, the star state before uh, returning the state in the switch case. We also have the decoder struct to keep everything together. We have five fields. The input one, obvious, okay. The state, just to say where we are and where we are going. Three uh, indexes to um, memor yeah, memorize where we are uh, into the string, analyzing the string, and the the results, the output. So uh, POS is actually an integer, um, nothing too fancy. How do we glue everything together? Um, we have a bunch of states, a single function, but where do we actually put everything together? Um, we, wrap, we put it in a, into a wrap, giant wrapper function that we call at the beginning to define everything uh, beforehand. So we have all the states defined and um, the meet function. And then we return the, the decoder. So we, we, we already initialized everything and um, this is the part you want to change if you're trying to decode different ba bases, for example, base 32 or 16. You just change what the states are and where they the point to. Or uh, if you want to add another variant, you just add a new uh, state inside, in, inside this wrapper function. And you don't touch the rest of the project. So it's easy to, to expand uh, this tool. And it's also easy to debug it, because the entire logic is in one single uh, file, one single function. You don't need to jump between places and trying to understand where you are and like what your indexes are and stuff like that. Uh, then when we, uh, we have initialized everything, we just um, call the main function, um, the decode function, that loops through the states and um, until it finds a nil state and then returns the result. Every time you call a state, the state will uh, go through the switch, do the action that uh, it needs to do. So if it needs to call the emit, we'll call the emit, and then return the, the next state. If uh, you find the end of string, we uh, um, will set that to nil. This function, then this function, uh, this for loop will find it nil and exit. So basically, we will loop through this for um, every time we read a character from our, from our string. So it's, yeah, people ask me to do some benchmarking. This solution was not the fastest, I agree. Um, I find that pretty useless to actually put it in number. Uh, my goal was not to write something that was faster, but it was uh, to code something that was reliable um, in order to accept different base 64 strings without staying there and uh, copy pasting them uh, on a, in a file, co copy the first half, decode the first half, you know, paste the first half, and then so on and so forth. Um, this way you can just paste an entire string, this, this same machine will go through it and uh, do its best to decode it. So 
why do we, did we like prefer this uh, solution? Well, as I said, it's easily debuggable. Um, you always know where you are and um, what stage uh, is next, it's next, what character you're parsing, what's your input. You know uh, what's going on in your code. Um, it's also easy to, easy to test because you can test one state at a time uh, and know what, like, what the output should look like. Easy man easy man easy man easy maintainable. And um, you have the entire complete picture of what's going on. You, you, you just draw it on paper, right? So uh, you always know what's going next, going, what's going to be next. So this thing is uh, really less complex. And that's what we are all here about. And yeah, I'm a bit early, um, but I can keep talking about final state machines if you're interested, or I guess it's almost lunchtime. Um, so you can find the code here. I find the, the QR really useful. Thank you, Rob, for the idea. Let's say you wanted to add a new standard because base64 is like 12 of them. Um, how big of a change in your code base would that cause? Uh, not so much. Um, so let's go back to here. So you add uh, a new state because the new standard is a new state. So we add just a circle and uh, a, a bunch of different errors. For example, errors that will go from the, ba from the base 64 to the new standard, and then from the start state to the new standard as well. And that's basically it. So you just write a new uh, function in the, in, the wrapper func uh, in the wrapper function that is here. So you, you just add uh, a new state in here, and that's it. Um, you want may maybe uh, to add some tests, but yeah, <laughs> so it's that easy. Other question? Hi, sorry, maybe this is a very dumb question, but um, so with that state machine, you basically assuming that you don't have, I mean, if a string is either URL or standard, but if you have like a URL and a standard without any weird character in between, you won't change the state. Is that correct? Yeah, ex exactly. Uh, let me find the, the same machine again. Uh, yeah, as you can see, there are no errors between the URL standard and the standard standard, standard the, the standard variant. Um, because it, it can re get really messy. Okay. So, so we, uh, we assume that if you use a one standard, you will keep using that standard until you use an, uh, an invalid character or whatever. And then if you encounter a valid character, you're, go you're going back here, and then you can switch standard. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to check that. Yeah. Thanks. Any? Okay. Okay. Thank you again.